Chapter 14 of Fifty Years in Chains or the Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fifty Years in Chains or the Life of an American Slave by Charles Ball. Chapter 14, Part 1. The country I now lived in was new and abounded with every sort of game common to a new settlement Wages were high and I could sometimes earn a dollar and a half a day by doing job work on Sunday The price of a day's work here was a dollar My master paid me regularly and fairly for all the work I did for him on Sunday And I never went anywhere else to procure work all his other hands were treated in the same way he also gave me an old gun that had seen much hard service for the stock was quite shattered to pieces and the lock would not strike fire I took my gun to a blacksmith in the neighborhood and he repaired the lock so that my musket was as sure fire as any piece need be I found upon trial that though the stock and lock had been worn out the barrel was none the worse for the service it had undergone I now for the first time in my life became a hunter in the proper sense of the word and generally managed my affairs in such a way as to get the half of Saturday to myself This I did by prevailing upon my master to set my task for the week on Monday morning Saturday was appropriated to hunting if I was not obliged to work all day and I soon became pretty expert in the use of my gun I made salt licks in the woods to which the deer came at night and I shot them from a seat of clapboards that was placed on the branches of a tree Raccoons abounded here and were of a large size and fat at all seasons in the month of April I saw the ground thickly strewed with nuts the growth of the last year I now began to live well notwithstanding the persecution that my mistress still directed against me and to feel myself in some measure an independent man the temper of my mistress grew worse daily and to add to my troubles the health of my master began to decline and towards the latter part of autumn he told me that already he felt the symptoms of approaching death this was a source of much anxiety and trouble to me for i saw clearly if i ever fell under the unbridled dominion of my mistress i should regret the worst period of my servitude in South Carolina I was afraid as winter came on that my master might grow worse and pass away in the spring for his disease was the consumption of the lungs we passed the winter in clearing land after we had secured the crops of cotton and corn and nothing happened on our plantation to disturb the usual monotony of the life of a slave except that in the month of January my master informed me that he intended to go to Savannah for the purpose of purchasing groceries and such other supplies as might be required on the plantation in the following season and that he intended to take down a load of cotton with our wagon and team and that I must prepare to be the driver this intelligence was not disagreeable to me as the trip to Savannah would in the first place release me for a short time from the tyranny of my mistress and in the second would give me an opportunity of seeing a great deal of strange country I derived a third advantage in after times from this journey But which did not enter into my estimate of this affair at that time My master had not yet erected a cotton gin on his place the land not being his own And we hauled our cotton in the seed nearly three miles to be ginned for which we had to give one-fourth to the owner of the gin when the time of my departure came I loaded my wagon with ten bales of cotton and set out with the same team of six mules that I had driven from South Carolina Nothing of moment happened to me until the evening of the fourth day when we were 100 miles from home My master stopped tonight for he traveled with me on his horse at the house of an old friend of his And I heard my master in conversation with this gentleman for such he certainly was give me a very good character and tell him that I was the most faithful and trusty Negro that he had ever owned He also said that if he lived to see the expiration of the seven years for which he had leased me He intended to buy me he said much more of me And I thought I heard him tell his friend something about my mistress 
but this was spoken in a low tone of voice, and I could not distinctly understand it. When I was going away in the morning with my team, this gentleman came out to the wagon and ordered one of his own slaves to help me put the harness on my mules. At parting, he told me to stop at his house on my return and stay all night, and said I should always be welcome to the use of his kitchen if it should ever be my lot to travel that way again. I mention these trifles to show that if there are hard and cruel masters in the South, there are also others of a contrary character. The slaveholders are neither more nor less than men, some of whom are good and very many are bad. My master and this gentleman were certainly of the number of the good, but the contrast between them and some others that I have seen was, unhappily for many of the slaves, very great. I shall hereafter refer to this gentleman at whose house I now was, and shall never name him without honor, nor think of him without gratitude. As I traveled through the country with my team, my chief employment beyond my duty of a team master was to observe the condition of the slaves on the various plantations by which we passed on our journey, and to compare things in Georgia, as I now saw them, with similar things in Carolina, as I had heretofore seen them. There is as much sameness among the various cotton plantations in Georgia as there is among the various farms in New York or New Jersey. Who who has seen one cotton field has seen all the other cotton fields, baiting the difference that naturally results from good and bad soils or good and bad culture. But the contrast that prevails in the treatment of the slaves on different plantations is very remarkable. We traveled a road that was not well provided with public houses, and we frequently stopped for the night at the private dwellings of the planters. And I observed that my master was received as a visitor, and treated as a friend in the family, whilst I was always left at the road with my wagon, my master supplying me with money to buy food for myself and my mules. It was my practice, when we remained all night at these gentlemen's houses, to go to the kitchen in the evening, after I had fed my mules and eaten my supper, and pass some time in conversation with the black people I might chance to find there. One evening we halted before sundown, and I unhitched my mules at the road, about two hundred yards from the house of a planter, to which my master went to claim hospitality for himself. After I had disposed of my team for the night, and taken my supper, I went as usual to see the people of color in the kitchen belonging to this plantation. The sun had just set when I reached the kitchen, and soon afterwards a black boy came in, and told the woman, who was the only person in the house when I came to it, that she must go down to the overseer's house. She immediately started, in obedience to this order and not choosing to remain alone in a strange house, I concluded to follow the woman and see the other people of this estate. When we reached the house of the overseer, the colored people were coming in from the field, and with them came the overseer and another man better dressed than overseers usually are. I stood at some distance from these gentlemen, not thinking it prudent to be too forward among strangers, the black people were all called together, and the overseer told them that some one of them had stolen a fat hog from the pen and carried it to the woods, and there killed and dressed it, and that he had that day found the place where the hog had been slaughtered, and that if they did not confess and tell who the perpetrators of this theft were, they would all be whipped in the severest manner. To this threat no other reply was made than a universal assertion of the innocence of the accused. They were all then ordered to lie down upon the ground and expose their backs, to which the overseer applied the thong of his long whip by turns until he was weary. It was fortunate for these people that they were more than twenty in number, which prevented the overseer from inflicting many lashes on any one of them. When the whole number had received each in turn a share of the lash, the overseer returned to the man to whom he had first applied the whip and told him he was certain that he knew who stole the hog, and that if he did not tell who the thief was, he would whip him all night. He then again applied the whip to the back of this man, until the blood flowed copiously. But the sufferer hid his face in his hands, and said not a word. The other gentleman then asked the overseer if he was confident this man had stolen the pig. 
and receiving an affirmative answer he said he would make the fellow confess the truth if he would follow his directions he then asked the overseer had he ever tried cat hauling upon an obstinate negro and was told that this punishment had been heard of but never practiced on this plantation a boy was then ordered to get up and run to the house and bring a cat which was soon produced the cat which was a large gray tom cat was then taken by the well-dressed gentleman and placed upon the bare back of the prostrate black man near the shoulder and forcibly dragged by the tail down the back and along the bare thighs of the sufferer the cat sunk his claws into the flesh and tore off pieces of the skin with his teeth the man roared with the pain of this punishment and would have rolled along the ground had he not been held in his place by the force of four other slaves each one of whom confined a hand or a foot as soon as the cat was drawn from him the man said he would tell who stole the hog and confessed that he and several others three of whom were then holding him had stolen the hog killed dressed and eaten it in return for this confession the overseer said he should have another touch of the cat which was again drawn along his back not as before from the head downwards but from below the hips to the head the man was then permitted to rise and each of those who had been named by him as a participator in stealing the hog was compelled to lie down and another cat twice drawn along his back first downwards and then upwards after the termination of this punishment each of the sufferers was washed with salt water by a black woman and they were then all dismissed this was the most excruciating punishment that i ever saw inflicted on black people and in my opinion it was very dangerous for the claws of the cat are poisonous and wounds made by them are very subject to inflammation during all this time i had remained at the distance of fifty yards from the place of punishment fearing either to advance or to retreat lest i too might excite the indignation of these sanguinary judges after the business was over and my feelings became a little more composed i thought the voice of the gentleman in good clothes was familiar to me but i could not recollect who he was nor where i had heard his voice until the gentleman at length left this place and went towards the great house and as they passed me i recognized in the companion of the overseer my old master the negro trader who had bought me in maryland and brought me to carolina i afterwards learned from my master that this man had formerly been engaged in the african slave trade which he had given up some years before for the safer and less arduous business of buying negroes in the north and bringing them to the south as articles of merchandise in which he acquired a very respectable fortune had lately married in a wealthy family in this part of the country and was a great planter two days after this we reached savannah where my master sold his cotton and purchased a wagon load of sugar molasses coffee shoes dry goods and such articles as we stood in need of at home and on the next day after i entered the city i again left it and directed my course up the country in savannah i saw many black men who were slaves and who yet acted as free men so far that they went out to work where and with whom they pleased received their own wages and provided their own subsistence but were obliged to pay a certain sum at the end of each week to their masters one of these men told me that he paid six dollars on every saturday evening to his master and yet he was comfortably dressed and appeared to live well savannah was a very busy place and i saw vast quantities of cotton piled up on the wharves but the appearance of the town itself was not much in favor of the people who lived in it on my way home i traveled for several days by a road different from that which we had pursued in coming down and at the distance of fifty or sixty miles from savannah i passed by the largest plantation that i have ever seen i think i saw at least a thousand acres of cotton in one field which was all as level as a bowling green there were as i was told three hundred and fifty hands at work in this field picking the last of the cotton from the burrs and these were the most miserable looking slaves that i had seen in all my travels it was now the depth of winter and although the weather was not cold yet it was the winter of this climate 
and a man who lives on the Savannah River a few years will find himself almost as much oppressed with cold in winter there as he would be in the same season of the year on the banks of the Potomac if he had always resided there. These people were, as far as I could see, totally without shoes, and there was no such garment as a hat of any kind amongst them. Each person had a coarse blanket, which had holes cut for the arms to pass through, and the top was drawn up round the neck so as to form a sort of loose frock tied before with strings. The arms, when the people were at work, were naked, and some of them had very little clothing of any kind besides this blanket frock. The appearance of these people afforded the most conclusive evidence that they were not eaters of pork, and that Lent lasted with them throughout the year. I again stayed all night, and as I went home with the gentleman whom I have before noticed as the friend of my master, who had left me soon after we quitted Savannah, and I saw him no more until I reached home. Soon after my return from Savannah, an affair of a very melancholy character took place in the neighborhood of my master's plantation. About two miles from our residence lived a gentleman who was a bachelor, and who had for his housekeeper a mulatto woman. The master was a young man not more than twenty-five years old, and the housekeeper must have been at least forty. She had children grown up one of whom had been sold by her master, the father of the bachelor, since I lived here, and carried away to the West. This woman had acquired a most unaccountable influence over her young master, who lived with her as his wife, and gave her the entire command of his house, and of everything about it. Before he came to live where he now did, and whilst he still resided with his father, to whom the woman then belonged, the old gentleman, perceiving the attachment of his son to this female, had sold her to a trader who was on his way to the Mississippi River, in the absence of the young man. But when the latter returned home, learned what had been done, he immediately set off in pursuit of the purchaser, overtook him somewhere in the Indian territory, and bought the woman of him at an advanced price. He then brought her back, and put her as his housekeeper on the place where he now lived, left his father, and came to reside in person with the woman. On a plantation adjoining that of the gentleman bachelor lived a planter who owned a young mulatto man named Frank, not more than twenty-four or five years old, a very smart as well as handsome fellow. Frank had become much enamored of this woman, who was old enough to have been his mother, as her master the bachelor was, and she returned Frank's attachment to the prejudice of her owner. Frank was in the practice of visiting his mistress at night, a circumstance of which her master was suspicious, and he forbade Frank from coming to the house. This only heightened the flame that was burning in the bosoms of the lovers, and they resolved after many and long deliberations to destroy the master. She projected the plot, and furnished the means for the murder, by taking her master's gun from the place where he usually kept it, and giving it to Frank who came to the house in the evening when the gentleman was taking his supper alone. Lucy always waited upon her master at his meals, and knowing his usual place of sitting, had made a hole between two of the logs of the house, toward which she knew his back would be at supper. At a given signal, Frank came quietly up to the house, leveled the shotgun through the hole prepared for him, and discharged a load of buckshot between the shoulders of the unsuspecting master, who sprang from his seat and fell dead beside the table. This murder was not known in the neighborhood until the next morning, when the woman herself went to a house on an adjoining plantation and told it. The murdered gentleman had several other slaves, none of whom were at home at the time of his death, except one man, and he was so terrified that he was afraid to run and alarm the neighborhood. I knew this man well, and believed he was afraid of the woman and her accomplice. I never had any doubt of his innocence, though he suffered a punishment upon no other evidence than mere suspicion far more terrible than any ordinary form of death. As soon as the murder was known to the neighboring gentlemen, they hastened to visit the dead body, and were no less expeditious in instituting inquiries after those who had done the bloody deed. My master was amongst the first who arrived at the house of the deceased, and in a short time half the slaves of the neighboring plantations were arrested and brought to the late dwelling of the dead man. 
For my own part, from the moment I heard of the murder, I had no doubt of its author. Silence is a great virtue when it is dangerous to speak, and I had long since determined never to advance opinions uncalled for in controversies between the white people and the slaves. Many witnesses were examined by a justice of the peace before the coroner arrived, but after the coming of the latter a jury was called, and more than half a day was spent in asking questions of various black people without the disclosure of any circumstance which tended to fix the guilt of the murder upon any one. My master, who was present all this time, at last desired them to examine me, if it was thought that my testimony could be of any service in the matter, as he wished me to go home to attend to my work. I was sworn on the testament to tell the whole truth, and stated at the commencement of my testimony that I believed Frank and Lucy to be the murderers, and proceeded to assign the reasons upon which my opinion was founded. Frank had not been present at this examination, and Lucy, who had been sworn, had said she knew nothing of the matter, and that at the time her master was shot she had gone into the kitchen for some milk for his supper, and that on hearing the gun she had come into the room at that moment he fell to the floor and expired, but when she opened the door and looked out she could neither hear nor see any one. When Frank was brought in and made to touch the dead body, which he was compelled to do, because someone said that if he was the murderer the corpse would bleed at his touch. He trembled so much that I thought he would fall, but no blood issued from the wound of the dead man. This compulsory touching of the dead had, however, in this instance, a much more powerful effect in the conviction of the criminal than the flowing of any quantity of blood could have had. For as soon as Frank had withdrawn his hand from the touch of the dead, the coroner asked him, in a peremptory tone, as if conscious of the fact why he had done this, Frank was so confounded with fear and overwhelmed by this interrogatory that he lost all self-possession and cried out in a voice of despair that Lucy had made him do it. Lucy, who had left the room when Frank was brought in, was now recalled and confronted with her partner in guilt. But nothing could wring a word of confession from her. She persisted that if Frank had murdered her master, he had done it of his own accord and without her knowledge or advice. Someone now for the first time thought of making search for the gun of the dead man, which was not found in the place where he usually kept it. Frank said he had committed the crime with this gun, which had been placed in his hands by Lucy. Frank, Lucy, and Billy, a black man against whom there was no evidence, nor cause of suspicion, except that he was in the kitchen at the time of the murder, were committed to prison in a new log house on an adjoining plantation, closely confined in irons, and kept there a little more than two weeks, when they were all tried before some gentlemen of the neighborhood, who held a court for that purpose. Lucy and Frank were condemned to be hung, but Billy was found not guilty, although he was not released, but kept in confinement until the execution of his companions, which took place ten days after the trial. End of chapter 14, part 1